Summer's here and so is one of the busiest weeks of the year so far. Glastonbury athletics, concerts, cricket and yet the country is about to grind to a halt. More than 50,000 workers on Britain's railways are about to walk out on strike. The biggest such action in decades. It'll mean huge disruption right across Britain. The Prime Minister calls it reckless and wanton. The Rail Workers Union says it has no choice. Meanwhile, airlines are cutting back flights this summer. Fuel prices keep rising. Will anyone manage to escape this summer? As the UK braces for days of travel disruption, I'll be speaking to the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, and asking whether there's anything more the government can do. Does Labour support the strikes? I'll put that to Shadow Cabinet member Lisa Nandy. I'll be talking to Ireland's Prime Minister, Michal Martin, after the British government began moves to change the post-Brexit arrangements in Northern Ireland. And the former Prime Minister and Chancellor Gordon Brown will be giving us his thoughts on some pressing problems from the economy to the refugee crisis. And reviewing the papers with me this morning is Alison Phillips, editor of The Daily Mirror, and Tom Newton Dunn, former political editor of The Sun, now presenting on Talk TV. We start, though, with the news with Ben Thompson. Sophie, thank you. Good morning. The Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, has accused the country's biggest rail union of punishing millions of innocent people after it confirmed it will go ahead with a series of crippling strikes. Mr Shapps said the travelling public faced a week of misery because the rail, maritime and transport union had refused to call off their action. It's due to start on Tuesday. But the RMT said politicians had prevented progress in talks. Boris Johnson has warned that people should steel themselves for a long war in Ukraine, saying that Russia will not stop at dismembering the country. The Prime Minister's comments echoed those of NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who said the conflict could last for years and urged Western leaders to plan long-term support for Ukraine. Parts of southern and western Europe have been hit by extreme heat this weekend, with the thermometer passing 40 degrees Celsius in some areas. Temperatures in both France and Spain have broken records under a wave of hot air that's moved north from Africa. Scientists say global warming makes extreme heat at this time of year more likely. And the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have released a new family photo to mark Father's Day. It shows Prince William with his children Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. It was taken last autumn in Jordan. Posting it on Twitter, the Duke and Duchess wished a happy Father's Day to the world's fathers and grandfathers. That's all from me for now. The next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. Sophie, back to you. Thank you very much. Well, let's look at the uh, front pages of the newspapers this morning. And uh, we've got The Observer, the main headline there, New Strike Chaos as Teachers and NHS Staff Warn of Action on Pay. The Mail also fo focusing on strikes. Starmer does support the rail strikers, says their headline. The Labour leader says he doesn't want walkouts, but a leak reveals that he secretly backs the union barons. Uh, photograph that's in lots of the papers as well this morning of Prince William, because it is, of course... Father's Day, if you had forgotten, don't forget. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph, unions bribing workers to strike is their headline. This is Kwasi Kwarteng, um, who's uh, railing, it says, at the doubling of payments to those taking part in the industrial action next week. And under a picture that's in a lot of papers as well this morning, uh, President Biden, who had a little bit of an incident on his bike. He got his toe caught in the clips on the pedal and went a cropper. The Sunday Times, steal yourselves for a long war, the Prime Minister warns the West. There's a, a piece written by him in the Sunday Times this morning as allies are urged to hold their nerve on aid for Ukraine. Uh, the uh, uh, Duchess of Cornwall in Vogue, that's the photograph there on the Sunday Express. Uh, an interview with her, which is also picked up in a lot of the papers this morning. Um, nobody likes to be looked at all of the time and criticised, but I sort of rise above it. She says, you've got to get on with life. And their main headline, it's time to take control of our borders. This is the Attorney General vowing to complete Brexit. And finally, the Sunday Mirror, and this is Dame Kelly Holmes. I'm finally free to be me, is the headline there. She um, Lots of coverage of this in the papers as she reveals she's hidden being gay 
for 34 years. Well, to discuss the papers with me this morning, Alison Phillips, the editor of the Daily Mirror, and Tom Newton Dunn, who is uh, now a presenter on Talk TV. Good morning to both of you. Morning. Uh, we're going to have to start with the strikes. Lots and lots of coverage. Um, in the papers of those this morning. Of course, the Sunday Telegraph, Tom, first of all. Unions bribing workers to strike. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's an interesting story. This is Kwasi Kwarteng, the business secretary, uh, making a very direct accusation that the RMT and other unions have built up great big slush funds now to fight these strikes and to fight these strikes for quite a long time. So they're going to double strike pay for strikers from, what, 35 quid a day to 70 pounds a day. And according to Kwasi Kwarteng, that's a bribe. Also, Kwasi looking forward to a couple of things he might do next week. Uh, lift that ban on agency workers coming in to replace striking workers and also increase the amount of money in damages that unions or the governments or businesses can claim off of striking unions. So I think really what you're seeing now is the battle lines drawn. I would contest, slightly controversial view perhaps, that the government are quite happy for this strike to go ahead, largely because the RMT they see as a good enemy and also they're desperate to clock up a victory uh, against a strike before perhaps others then join throughout the summer. Um, because that's the coverage in a lot of the other papers, well, the Observer particularly, isn't it? Whether mm. or not there will be more strikes ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to this, the Kwasi Kwarteng story, I mean, what I think we're seeing here is, is a, another government attempt to inflame this strike rather than perhaps try and reach some kind of uh, negotiated settlement. I mean, we know that Grant Shapps hasn't really been involved in any attempts to, to, to try and reach an agreement or to, you know, to help Network Rail reach an agreement. And then, and Could so... Could he have done more? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I think he could have done more. I mean, I think it's like a month since he, he last had any meetings with the union leaders. Now, yes, of course, it's Network Rail's responsibility to have those negotiations. But, but when we have the idea that lots of people aren't going to be able to get to work later in this week, children won't be able to get to exams. If you're the transport secretary, that's your gig. That's for you to sort out. And the idea that rather than do that, in a week that we've got by-elections, they're seeking to inflame the situation, I think is really quite disappointing. And Unless you want to win the argument. I mean, well, you know, uh, if you're absolutely. the you'd say the taxpayers spent £20 billion keeping the rails going during COVID. It has to modernise. But, we but, just simply have to win this argument. But that we can't is, afford to keep it going. And modernise means cutting jobs. Cutting well, jobs, but, but not, closing ticket offices. Yes, I mean, that's another story around today about closing ticket offices. So, is it, But I think that's the point. Is it about winning an argument or is it about trying to reach a negotiated settlement for later in this week? But, and as Tom said, I mean, so in The Observer, this story is that we've got the teaching unions talking about p potential strikes later in, the week, later in the year. You've got Unison, the health union, talking <coughs> about it. So there is this idea that it is building. There's a momentum building. There was tens of thousands of people marching through London yesterday from all sorts of industries saying that they, we demand better, that workers demand better, and that, that this isn't going away um, and it's going to be a, a difficult old summer. And The Sun has got a piece about uh, the RMT leader, Mick Lynch, hasn't it? It does. Uh, strike chief wants to be the new Scargill. Now, anyone under the age of 40 probably doesn't remember who Arthur Scargill is, but for, for us, and I certainly speak for perhaps Sophie and I, but, and uh, to judge Alison here. Uh, Arthur Scargill, of course, led the National Union of Mine Workers throughout the 80s, those, those long strikes, which, of course, the Thatcher government eventually won. I would also say that Mick Lynch, who runs the RMT, is a pretty good villain for the government to have right now. I mean, he looks like a tough guy, looks like a bit of a prize fighter, uh, someone they could e quite easily demonise the sun, helping them uh, with that today. But, you know, you then go on and you look at the NEU, front page of The Observer, talking about balancing their 450,000 uh, members, their teachers, if they don't get uh, a decent pay rise, if not inflation linked, then very closer to inflation, certainly higher than 3% on the table now. That's a harder enemy. Ditto nurses, Unison, uh, and the other nursing unions wanted to break away from Unison. These are all going to be big battles the government are going to have to fight. And, and you know, for me... There's no narrative in the government what to do about this. And there's it? no easy answer, is there? Let's Not look at, at the uh, Sunday Times as well, because that's about the Prime Minister going this week off to Ukraine, a surprise visit there, and uh, him saying that uh, new Ukraine needs time, doesn't it? Is, is it? We're in for the long haul. Yes, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, the um, Prime Minister was supposed to be sort of um, going north, talking about levelling up, talking about uh, he was going, supposed to be going to Wakefield, where the by-election is, but um, went to Ukraine instead. And he's written a piece where he says, um, I think because there's been some concerns in the last few days about are the Allies fraying, are there some people becoming, you know, some countries becoming less committed to the Ukraine effort. And um, so he's, the, he's saying there's got to be a long-term, constant funding, technical help, helping them get supplies in, food in, um, and that really all, all the allies really need to, 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 keep, to, keep to, the, to keep that backing for Ukraine, which there is a concern that it could be starting to fray. Yeah, and there's the word Ukraine fatigue that uh, he, he spoke about. 
I, I think undoubtedly Ukraine fatigue exists. I mean, all of us, you know, the programme I present on, on Talk TV, the, the news says every day we think, what do you do with Ukraine? Because effectively this is a war now that the story hasn't changed much. There's bitter, awful stalemate now around the town of Severodonetsk. It's a very hard story to tell and we wrestle, as do you at the BBC, as does Anderson at the Mirror, with how much prominence do we give a story that effectively haven't changed. And undoubtedly, this is the biggest concern the Ukrainian government have. The world is getting bored. When the world gets bored, that only helps Vladimir Putin. And, and yet, even worse, even worse than bored, is that with rising energy costs, people become resentful mm. almost of the cost of this. So that, and, and, and so this is an attempt to keep it on the front, front story. Um, not on the front pages, but something that will uh, no doubt dominate later in the week of the by-elections that are taking place uh, in Wakefield and Tiverton and Honiton. An interesting take on that, the Telegraph uh, talking about how Boris Johnson's absent from some of the election literature in, in Honiton. Who'd have thought it, taking the lead of your own party off your by-election leaflets? Uh, this is not a new thing. Um, it's not even a new thing for mid-term prime ministers. But uh, Tiverton and Wakefield. Wakefield, far smaller Tory majority, classic Labour seat. I don't think anyone would be surprised that went straight So that's straight a sort of 3,000 majority, Ooh. isn't it? Whereas Honiton and Tiverton is more than 24,000. 24,200. Could they lose that? Yeah. Yeah, they could easily lose that. And it would be an extraordinary loss. Uh, they have lost seats to that sort of size. Uh, Amersham uh, and Chesham was a, a similar size sort of loss. But this really, I think, talks into the, the, the Tory party's internal psychosis at the moment, which is this is not red wall seats slipping back to Labour. This is true blue heartlands going to the Lib Dems, the blue wall, if mm. you like. And that, that worries uh, number 10. It is baked in, though. I, I think everybody expects the government to lose both by-elections. So the political ramifications as a result will probably be smaller than perhaps maybe they should Although be. the Express says that it's an acid test for the Prime Minister and it could bring his future into doubt again. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, so that was why everybody had initially thought that the um, confidence vote would be after the by-elections, but of course we had that before. But he's <clears throat> by no means safe. And, and like you say, yes, it is baked in. And there is sort of um, expectation management going on about, oh, yes, we're going to lose Honiton and Tiverton. But it's still a huge, huge seat to lose. And I think anybody, so anybody, any, any Tory MP who's got a, a majority of less than 23, 24,000 mm. is going to be thinking, I'm in real trouble now. And the one thing that Boris Johnson was always supposedly able to give them was a winning mindset and the ability to win anything. If he's no longer able to offer them the opportunity to win, what is he giving them? They won't even put him on the campaign well, leaflet. World leadership. That, I mean, that's what he suggests. <laughs> well, he's on absolutely. the front page of the Times yeah. Ukraine. At the time of the by-election, he's going to be halfway to Africa for the Commonwealth Heads of Government Summit. Then there's the G Summit over next weekend. But so you can see how he's shaping the narrative. You can see why he's doing that. But in the middle of a cost of living crisis, how mm. many people actually care? That's the, that's the issue. Yeah. They want him here leading on the issues that people are most concerned about. And talking of leadership, uh, there's a piece in the Sunday Times about Keir Starmer. I think it's just on the inside of the Sunday Times there, isn't it? Mm. Um, saying that he is uh, nervous and uh, that he's also already talking about plans for succession in case he's found to have broken COVID. Yes, I mean, down. I don't think he's nervous in, the, in terms of that he thinks he's about to, to have to stand down, as he said he would if he was um, uh, found to have broken the rules in Durham. I think it's more, the, the nervousness is more around that if he were to go, um, what would happen to the party? And I think this is very much about ensuring that, that anybody that was to replace him would, would, would sort of keep on a moderate route. And I think there's a line about it doesn't want it to return to the basket case, as I think it's mm. referred to as it was under, under Corbyn. But the people he's supposed to have spoken to are people like West Streeting, Lisa Nandy. Yes, I mean, all the people that have been sort of uh, tipped to be in the frame were he to stand down. So, so I think it's more about that he wants, he wants the, the modifications that he's made to continue rather than to go backwards. It's a mighty strange thing to fly, though. I mean, that feels like it's a couple of the papers. It feels like it's actually been briefed by Labour High Command. I don't know that for sure. But it's an odd thing to put out there, prepare for my departure. It just makes you think. If he doesn't have to go, he's not forced to resign by Durham Police or by his own uh, promise to, to voters, then is he now just becoming self-aware, perhaps, that he's not actually going to be the man who's going to win the next general election and for the Labour Party. Finally, let's talk about Kelly Holmes on the, uh, the front of the mirror. There's a lot of coverage about this this morning. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic story. So um, Dame Kelly Holmes, um, Olympic gold medal winner, came to the Sunday Mirror and said that she really wanted to tell this story about how she was gay, but she'd never felt able to be public about that. And, I mean, we were saying that it's, it's a, it's a, for younger people now, being gay, being part of their identity, isn't something they would feel they necessarily need to come out about. But I think, you know, Kelly Holmes is 52, it's a sort of different generation. I think it's just, you know, it, 
there's something quite tragic that she's had to get to 52 before she felt she could publicly be gay. And, and there's another really sort of tragic line that she was in the army when she was younger at a time when it was, it, she would have been breaking all the rules, she'd have been kicked out of the army. And that's the reason she came to the mirror with the story because we've been fighting a campaign for recognition for gay people who have been in the armed services and, and were kicked out in the past. So it's, it's a moment really. Uh, great scoop for the mirror. Really powerful story and an incredibly powerful interview with Kelly Holmes, one of our greatest ever Olympians who talks for 30 years. She introduced her girlfriend to people as my PA. And the, the shame what of having to do it? that is desperately mm. embarrassing. Of course, it's Pride Month, mm. so good on her. But I agree with you. I think it's amazing in the third decade of the 21st century uh, that you have to come out in this way and it's not any longer normal. And finally, there you are. That's that uh, photograph on the front of the Sunday, uh, the, Telegra uh, the Telegraph, the Times. There you are, Prince William and his, uh, his children. So, Tom... Alison, are you going home to? Are you going home to a nice Father's Day breakfast now? Well, I hope so because my uh, one one son is <laughs> already a teenager, teenager now. Awake? There's zero chance of him being awake <laughs> at seven a.m. when I left this morning. So happy Father's Day! Thank you very Hello, much. Very, very sweet <laughs> and thank you both very much for joining me this morning. Now, it certainly got a little cooler yesterday. Uh, what happened to all that heat? Louise Lear is going to tell us. Hello, you're still looking very summery. I'm going to take a take cheer from that. It's not been a bad start, I tell you, Sophie. For some of us, lots of sunshine out there. But yes, if you did have the heat, it was much more comfortable yesterday. And for many, I think that that was probably come as welcome news. You can see where the best of the sunshine has been across eastern England and central England at the moment. A little bit of showery rain down to the south, a few scattered showers running down through the Cheshire Gap and a few into Scotland. And those are where we're likely to see those showers continue on, on and off through the day today. But in the sunshine, it'll be pleasant enough. But you've got to factor in the strength and the direction of the wind and northwesterly. So that that means on exposed north and west facing coast will be that little bit cooler, 14 to 17 degrees. We might see temperatures peaking into the low 20s if we keep that sunshine coming through. Now, overnight tonight, that front down to the south will tend to linger, produce some thundery downpours potentially across the southwest and rather breezy with it as well. Clearer skies further north before we get another front pushing into the far northwest. So on Monday, a dry, settled, sunny start for many. Cloud and light patchy rain pushes into northwest Scotland and north. Northern Ireland. Top temperatures on Monday in the sunshine, a degree or so up on today. We might see highs of 22 or 23 degrees and then the warmth is set to return. Not the extreme warmth that we had last week, but we will see temperatures in England and Wales back into the mid to high 20s. Sophie. Louise, thank you very much. Well, let's talk more now about next, this week's rail strikes. I'm joined by the shadow levelling up secretary, Lisa Nandy, who is in Coventry at Labour's local government conference. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Good um, morning. If you worked on the railways, would you have voted to go on strike over pay and safety this week? I don't work on the railways. I work in Parliament and uh, my job is to make sure that we actually resolve this, which is what politicians are meant to be doing. I don't want strikes to have to go ahead. None of us want strikes to have to go ahead. Um, and I live in the north of England, Sophie. I know what it means when the railways grind to a halt because we've had a decade of underfunding and bad management and broken promises. But that's why the government has got to get round the table with the train station staff, the ticket office staff, the cleaners, who just a couple of years ago Grant Shapps was calling true heroes and sort this out because they're the only ones who can. They took the negotiating mandate away from train operating co companies in the pandemic. They haven't given it back. And it's no use saying to people, get round the table if you've taken away the table. The biggest problem that this country faces right now is not militant workers, it's a militant government. But I want to know, though, if you think that the strikes are reasonable, and I'm asking you if you would have voted to go on strike this week over pay and safety. Your colleague, Wes Streeting, was able to answer that. Why can't you? Because I think it's unreasonable to put working people, whether they're trying to use the railways to go to work or they're trying to keep the railways running, especially those who came out day after day to do it in a pandemic, against one another, when the reality is everybody is losing. The problem isn't threatened strike action on the railways. The problem is a government that is on strike and not doing its job. In Wales, there are no strikes. Why? Because you have a Labour government. In England, we have strikes because we've got a Conservative government that since the beginning of March has 
has not lifted a finger to resolve this. They haven't met or engaged in the talks since the 8th of March. But that's simply not good enough. And I don't know how Grant Shapps has the brass neck to tour the TV studios when the buses aren't working, the airports are in chaos, the rails are about to, I'm to grind going to talk to, to him. I'm going to talk to him. And but tell people I... it's somebody else's fault. What I want to know is, are you, Labour, for or against these strikes? Are these strikes reasonable? I am on the side of people who are asking to be listened to and for the government to come to the table and negotiate seriously with them. Those true heroes that Grant Shapps talked about and the people that they serve who use the railways to get to work. They're not, you know, I was down at Wigan Northwestern a couple of days ago. They're not clamouring for strike action. They're asking for safety and security on the railways. They're asking not to be replaced with agency staff. They're asking not to lose their jobs. And they're asking for a government that takes seriously the request for a pay settlement at a time when inflation is soaring and every single working person, every business in this country is struggling. That's what the government should be focused on and the reason we're in this situation is not because of any of the workforce in this country. The reason we're in this situation is because we've got an appalling government that blames everyone but themselves when anyone what, can see that in this country things are not working at it, the moment. What is a fair pay rise? Given the levels of inflation at the moment, what is a fair pay rise? Well, first of all, it's a, a collective bargaining process. No, but so I'm talking we about a figure. I'm just talking about... With what... Let me ask you just a figure, though. I mean, no, we, I'm not, the I'm RMT not, are asking for 11 per cent. They want to match inflation. What is a fair pay rise? Is it 3 per cent? Is it 5 per cent? Or should RMT workers be getting 11 per cent? Well, I'm not going to undermine a collective bargaining process. We have these processes for a reason. It's because time after time over the last century, when employers and workers have come together, they've been able to reach an agreement about what is fair and affordable and what helps people to make ends meet. At the moment, the problem we've got is that the government isn't prepared to do that. Part of the reason we've got problems on the railways at the moment is because they've sacked a lot of the staff yeah, but I'm and they're running you on what, an overtime model, fair... which means that when people aren't at work, the train's simply aren't running. I'm asking you what Th a that's fair why they've pay got to get around the table be. and start negotiating with people. And I'm asking you what a fair yeah, but pay I'm not going to preempt a but I'm not going to preempt a collective bargaining process because otherwise you undermine the ability to reach an agreement that is affordable and is also fair to the people who run our public and private services. That happens in the private sector, it happens in the public sector. It's a long-standing principle that the employer, and in this case the government, who's taken that negotiating mandate back from the train operating companies, has to come to the table, sit down and reach an agreement, not just about pay, but also about the very real security concerns that frontline workers have been raising about our railways, including removing guards from the train okay. uh, over the last few years. And the fact that they won't is, frankly, the reason that we're in this situation. Can I ask you, have you spoken to Keir Starmer about succession plans in case he is fined over COVID rules and has to step down? No, this is absolute nonsense. I've seen Keir Starmer twice in the last couple of days, once to try and work out how we're going to get the government to use this last 48 hours to lift a finger to resolve the crisis on the railways. So you've had and, no conversations with him agreement. at all about And succession. secondly, about local government funding, which is causing real problems. I've had no conversation with Keir Starmer about succession because after 12 dark, divisive years where the government is briefing out, even this week, that there are wedgish... They've had a good week. They're calling it wedge week because they're pitting workers against one another. We've got to get rid of this Tory government. This is the thing that's holding the country back and we're determined that we're going to be not just an opposition but an alternative. There's been a lot of focus this week, hasn't there, on Keir Starmer and his personality. Some of your shadow cabinet uh, colleagues quoted as saying that he's boring people to death. Can a boring man become the Prime Minister of the UK? I don't think it's boring to want to abide by the rules that you set. To make, to make the rules break the rules, laugh about it and lie about it is what we've got at the moment. I would find it deeply exciting to have a Prime Minister who was prepared to act with honour and integrity and abide by the rules that he himself had made. And we're here in Warwick today saying we're going to smash up a century of centralisation in order to get power back into local hands. We've done it before when we were last in government <coughs> in Grimsby. We brought wind energy to, to the people of Grimsby. In uh, Rotherham, we brought advanced manufacturing. If we get power into the right hands, we could rebuild this country the only way that we can from the ground up. That's not boring. That's the future of Britain. Lisa Nandy, thank you.
Well, it strikes me much of Britain is going to grind to a halt this week. Meanwhile, in Northern Ireland, there's paralysis of a different kind. The Stormont Assembly is not sitting because of the wrangling over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, the government has started moves to change it without the agreement of the EU. The European Commission says the UK is breaking international law and has started legal action. There's even talk of a trade war. But the Prime Minister says the protocol needs fixing to get Northern Ireland's government up and running again. What it does is it creates unnecessary barriers on, on trade east-west. Uh, what, we, what we can do is fix that. It's not a big deal. Uh, we can fix it in such a way as to remove those bureaucratic barriers, but without putting up barriers on trade moving north-south in the island of Ireland uh, as well. Boris Johnson earlier this week. Well, Ireland's Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, Michal Martin, joins me now from Cook. Good morning. Good morning. Now, the UK is suggesting red and green lanes to remove costs and paperwork on goods moving within the UK, but preserving full checks on goods entering the EU via Northern Ireland. What is wrong with that idea? Well, first of all, uh, the, the unilateral decision of the British government to bring in legislation to undermine or to give the power to undermine almost all aspects of the protocol uh, is not acceptable. Uh, it represents unilateralism of the worst kind in terms of honouring and adhere, adhering to international agreements that governments uh, adhere to and sign up to and ratify in their parliaments. Uh, the, we, we, we accept fully their legitimate issues around the operation of the protocol and we believe with serious sustained negotiations between the European Union and the United Kingdom government those issues could be uh, resolved. But what I would say is that the legislation that is published does much more than you are suggesting because uh, it effectively uh, would be severely damaging to the Northern Ireland economy, particularly in the context of the dual regulatory standards approach now being put forward by the British government, uh, which is deeply concerning to industry and to businesses in Northern Ireland, and in effect represents a form of economic vandalism on Northern Ireland, because the... if you look at any objective data, is now showing that Northern Ireland economy is doing very well. Uh, manufacturing is doing very well. The dairy industry, the meat industry, the food industry generally in agriculture is doing very well. There are certain areas uh, where we can improve the protocol, uh, and we should continue to do that. What, though, I mean, the, um, the, on the specifics, the details, why would that plan that the UK government is putting forward not work? Because it is not that far away from the, the ideas that the EU came up with about trusted, uh, trusted partners and, and fast-track lanes. It's not that far away. What is wrong with the UK's plan? That specific issue that you reference in terms of goods going to the Northern Ireland from the UK, uh, the, 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 that specific proposal is one which um, the European Union is ready to, to negotiate with and on with the United Kingdom government. But the U European Union is waiting for the United Kingdom to get engaged in substantive negotiations. Ultimately, that's the only way this can be resolved, uh, is through substantive negotiations between the European Union and the United Kingdom government. Uh, and in our view, issues of the kind that you have referenced can, of course, uh, be, be, be dealt with and negotiated. Uh, but, of course, the legislation introduced last week and published last week is far wider um, than that uh, and is very, very worrying in terms of the actual damage it could do to key sectors of the Northern Ireland economy that has been doing quite well under the protocol. And I feel that that story about the sectors of the Northern Ireland economy that are currently doing well is not being um, articulated enough uh, within the United the Kingdom. And I would urge people in the British government to talk in more detail with Northern Ireland business, with the Brexit business working group, the people okay. in manufacturing and different sectors of the economy. The EU Vice President, Maris Osefkovic, says that if the UK passes this bill that it started, it's putting in process now, then Northern Ireland is going to lose access to the single market. Is he right? Well, if, if uh, this bill is enacted, I think we're into a very serious situation. But of course, no would one would it in lose Northern access Ireland, to the single um, market? Then? No one in the island of our, our, no one in Northern Ireland, and no one in the island of Ireland wants Northern Ireland to lose access to, to the EU market. Is that what uh, would happen? And I think that's one consistent thread. Uh, well, I think if if we have a complete unilateral reneging 
on an international agreement that the United Kingdom government itself signed up to and, ra and recommended ratification to its parliament, which its parliament subsequently did, then, then of course we're in a very serious situation. But we want to avoid that. Nobody wants um, a trade war um, in, in any shape or form. We want this resolved. We believe it can be resolved um, with goodwill. Uh, and I've met all of the political parties in Northern Ireland. I've met with industry in Northern Ireland. Uh, we believe we, we, we know where there's a landing zone to resolve issues around the operation of the protocol uh, to, to, to give Northern Ireland the, the best chance in terms of you know, access, obviously, to the European Union market and the UK market, of course. Uh, and that would position Northern Ireland well in terms of inward investment. And companies like Almac, a global biopharma, now adding uh, 1,000 jobs because of the Almac advantage, which is the protocol. Indigenous companies like Dale Farm, Wright Bus, for example, winning a major contract with Cologne in terms of hydrogen bus buses, and with the Republic also uh, in terms of the future. You've talked I think about there are great opportunities here for business and jobs in Northern Ireland, uh, which needs to be acknowledged you've now. You've talked about and, the legality. It um, hasn't been to date. You've talked about the legality of this, and you say that it is illegal what the government is doing, acting unilaterally. Article 16 of the protocol does allow for unilateral measures, doesn't it, if there are serious economic, societal harms or a diversion of trade. And that is what is happening in Northern Ireland at the moment, isn't it? Stormont is not sitting. The government there is paralysed. Well, first of all, the, there's no economic harm happening uh, that would justify the invo invocation of Article 16 or indeed the legislation that has been contemplated uh, or has been published. I mean, the obvious thing to do is to get into negotiations. Uh, the European Union has proven its flexibility, produced proposals uh, last October, which you have said yourself contain a basis uh, to reach a resolution with the British government. But what now needs to happen is really substantive negotiations between the British government and the European Union. Maris Sefcovic is a very flexible person. He has pushed the boat out significantly. He wants a resolution. President von der Leyen wants a resolution. President of the Council, Charles Michel, wants a resolution. The British government is saying, the Prime Minister is saying, he wants uh, a negotiated set settlement, preferably. Well, then let's get down to it. Let's get involved in discussions. Uh, unilateralism you, you has talk, never worked in the context of the Good about, Friday you, Agreement. You say how flexible the EU is being, but at the moment the, pro the actual protocol hasn't been fully implemented, has it? And businesses in Northern Ireland don't want it to be fully implemented. implemented. The European Commission says it has to be full, fully implemented. That's not flexible, is it? Well, I think the European Union has been flexible already. You've just said yourself that aspects of it haven't even been implemented given the fact that the European Union has been flexible and has wanted to create an environment to get into serious uh, negotiations. And business doesn't uh, want it to be implemented. But I would have to, to contest the assertion. Well, hold on. I, I mean, who are you talking to in business? I would invite you to talk to the manufacturing sector in Northern Ireland. I would invite you to talk to the food industry in Northern Ireland. Well, the Northern Ireland I would invite business you to talk Brexit to the working sector group. sector in general. Uh, the Northern Ireland yeah, Business Brexit Working I, Group I've, says I've, we've always been clear that full implementation of obligations under the protocol was going to be present, was going to present great challenges. I have met that Brexit Business Working Group. They are very, very concerned with this legislation because it is damaging and would be damaging if implemented to key sectors of the Northern Ireland economy. And it, there really is an obligation on the, on the Foreign Secretary and the British Government to engage with that group. Uh, and I've said that they should be uh, involved in the uh, nuts and bolts of any resolution of this. We agree with them, with that group, in terms of issues that do arise from the protocol. We've always acknowledged that. We believe there are issues around the operation of the protocol that affect uh, a small uh, you know, minority of, of, of business uh, in, in Northern Ireland. We should resolve those. There's a way to resolving those. We are open as part of the European Union to resolving those. But do not underestimate the damaging impact of this legislation on sectors of the, Irish, of the Northern Irish economy that has been doing very well. I mean, manufacturing at the moment has had its best year in 19 years. 19 years has had its best year this year. And people are trying to suggest that somehow the protocol has been damaging. I mean, there's 90,000 jobs. It's an increase of 2.5% in its performance. You've mentioned I mean, the we word... need to get real here in terms of what the reality is on the ground in terms of key sectors of the Northern Ireland economy. And talking, talking of should, reality... Certainly anything we do should not undermine it. Yeah. Talking of reality, you've, you've already mentioned the word trade war. There's not really going to be a trade war with the, between the UK and the EU at this point in time, is there, given what is going on and much bigger issues, Ukraine, the cost of living crisis? We're not really looking at a trade war, are we? 
Well, I think you may have referenced the trade war initially. I certainly don't want a trade war. Nobody wants a trade war. That would be very damaging to all of us, uh, the United Kingdom, to, to Ireland, to European Union more generally. And as you say, there are far more significant issues um, in terms of the war on Ukraine, uh, which is uh, deeply damaging uh, and, and horrific, brutal war. And I pay tribute to the United Kingdom government for the role that it has played uh, in supporting uh, the Ukrainian government. And uh, the European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States, all of the democratic world need to be aligned on the fundamentals of maintaining a multilateral rules-based order. And that essentially is what is at stake in terms of the war in Ukraine. And that is why uh, we are uh, saying consistently that the issue around the operation of the protocol, and there are issues, and I've said this to the unionist politicians, I've met unionist political parties, there's a way of resolving those. And that way is through negotiations. And, the, and the, the trade agreement and protocol agreement with the United Kingdom government has mechanisms within it to resolve issues mm. that may be negatively impacting on certain sectors okay. of business in Northern Ireland. Everybody is up to resolving those. That's the obvious way forward. Okay. Michal Martin, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Inflation is on the rise, predicted to hit 11% later this year. That's what the Bank of England said this week. The economy looks set to contract this quarter and interest rates have risen to their highest level since 2009. Back then, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister and dealing with the aftermath of the global financial crash. What does he make of the current situation today? He joins me now from Fife. Good morning. Good morning. So the Bank of England is saying that inflation is going to reach 11%. Do you think it could go even higher? It's going to be high and Britain's going to have some of the worst inflation. But this is, first of all, a global problem that needs a global solution. Uh, we're actually leaderless at the moment, but we're not powerless. We could do what we did in 2009 and bring people together. There's a food crisis, 800 million on the verge of starvation. There's an energy crisis with oil prices going up, affecting every country. Inflation crisis, recession in prospect, and of course on top of COVID and conflict and climate change, which is affecting every country. So Boris Johnson may be going to Rwanda and then to Germany, but he really ought to be getting world leaders together and they should concoct a plan that deals in a concerted and comprehensive way that can get oil prices down, can get food supply moving around the world and co can get control of inflation. Now, and this is initially something that they can do as a global uh, initiative by world leaders. You said in an article in a, in, the paper this, in a newspaper today that the country is facing a set of challenges similar to the 1930s, the so-called devil's decade. Do you really think it could be that bad here? Well, we've got protectionism, we've got war in Europe, we've got a form of jingoism and nationalism in different countries pursuing their own selfish interests, uh, and we're in danger of having a global recession. So we have to face up to these problems. I say Churchill said that people at the time were resolved to be a resolute and adamant for drift and solid for fluidity and all-powerful for impotence, and that's, I'm afraid, where the world looks at the moment. When people say they don't know what the plan is, that's because there is no plan. We've got to get together and agree how we can combat both the energy and food crisis initially and then get control of inflation. Now, there are domestic things we can do and we can come to that, but initially you need to get world leaders together. We did it before and we did it, of course, at other crucial times facing multiple crises and this is one of the biggest crises that the world has faced for many you, years. You know all about inflation, obviously, your role as Chancellor, you've, you've, you're well steeped in that. But I just want to get a sense from you of how much worse you think it could get. You said it could be, it will be high. Will it be higher than 11 per cent? Well, it, it could be, but, but I think the most important thing that you've got to recognise is we've got both inflation and the prospect of recession. And it's when the two come together that living standards fall, jobs are at risk, and, of course, family budgets are under huge uh, pressure. And the government really does need a plan. I am proposing a fourth budget. We've had three budgets this year. We need to do three things. First of all, we need to get inflation on a pathway towards stable prices. And quite frankly, the Bank of England has not done that. Uh, secondly, the government's got to help ease family poverty because child poverty is going to go beyond five million if we don't take further action. And thirdly, I think what people are really looking for is a plan for growth, to get out of this, a plan, an industry policy. Now, Britain's one of the few countries without a policy for industry. Uh, a trade policy, Mikhail Martin just talked about this. Uh, we don't have a trade deal either with America or with Europe. So in or out of Brexit, we've really got to get our trading relations sorted out. 
And we've got enormously good technology in IT and digital and environmental technology, medical and life sciences. And we really have to have a growth plan that people can come behind to show that living standards can rise over the next few years and at the same time we can afford our public services. Now, without Give that plan, and there is no plan, there is no programme of action, the government is going from crisis to crisis and scandal to scandal. We cannot see the way out of this. We will have pain now and pain later. What we need is minimising pain now and maximising gain later. In, two, in 2006, you capped pay rises, didn't you, for public sector workers for three years in order to control inflation. Why is that different now? Well, inflation was very low at that point. Look, what, what we've got at the moment is a unique set of, uh, of circumstances. Uh, and you can understand that this is not one group of workers trying to leapfrog another. This is almost every worker in the country facing the biggest hit on their standards of living for 50 years. Now, any sensible government would get people round the table. I would have a national economic council and bring people together. I would explain to them what the problem really is globally and nationally. And I would show them that they could share in the, in the proceeds of growth uh, if we can get things sorted out, that we can be fair. Yes, there maybe have to be a cap on executive pay because that has been rising fast. And at the same time, of course, uh, I think we've got to show that we have a plan for growth. People so must know that there's some purpose in what is happening now. And the government has not set forward a plan that shows we can actually get growth back in the future. So we, what are, is we are a country that's lost a mil... What is a fair pay rise, though, for, for, for public sector workers, people who are really struggling with bills now, who are trying to keep up with the rising prices? What is a fair pay rise for, for public sector workers? Would you well, that, that, advocate one? Well, that's, that's for negotiation, obviously, because I'm not uh, party to all the facts about what's happening. But the important thing, it's got to be over one year, two years and three years. You can't just talk about this year. You've got to talk about the pressure on the standards of living next year and the year after. And people have got to see a way out of this. At the moment, uh, no government minister can explain any strategy for the next year, two years or three years. There is no plan, no programme of action, and there's got to be one. Otherwise, you can't bring people along with you. And when we have a global crisis and also a worsening national crisis, because we will have higher inflation and lower growth pros prospects, you've got to show that you've got action at a global scale and action at a national scale. It's what we tried to do in 2009, and we dealt with the global financial crisis. We've got a multiple set of crises now, and I think we can deal with them by showing people we have a way through. Is tax cuts a way out of this crisis? Well, I suspect that what the government will have to do in the autumn is uh, abandon their corporate uh, tax uh, rise. I suspect they'll not be able to go ahead with their fuel tax rise because that's another pressure, obviously, on, on inflation. Uh, but what you need to do is look at a fair set of uh, uh, answers. And the first thing they've got to do, I'll be honest about this, I am shocked by the fact that so many families and so many children are going to be forced into poverty during this winter. Despite Chancellor Sunak's uh, proposals last month, I see millions of families in poverty and millions of children going to school ill-clad and hungry, people unable to afford to put up their heating. Now, something has got to be done about this, and it has to be done in a far fairer way than the previous three budgets. That's why I'm pressing. You may have had three budgets, and that may seem enough, but you're going to have a fourth budget. It's absolutely essential, not just to deal with family poverty, but to show a pathway forward to growth, uh, including stable prices. Income tax but we do need a policy for our industry. What about income tax cuts, though? Is that, can, you, can you get out of this with an income tax cut now? Well, 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 the government's got a problem because they're promising income tax cuts at the same time as they're promising better public services. And they're going to have to be honest with the public about what can be afforded. Uh, my view is we must take action to get people's standards of living, uh, costs of living down. Uh, but that is probably through helping uh, those middle and lower income families who, because of uh, the numbers of children who are in poverty, uh, need help at the moment. And that is probably the best way of doing it. You, you say in your book that uh, you've written a book about the coming together, the world coming together to solve big global issues like, for example, the war in Ukraine, like the refugee crisis. Arguably, the war in Ukraine has, has brought the West together. Boris Johnson has just been in, in Kyiv this week at the forefront of, of Western efforts to, to respond to Russian aggression. You must agree with that. Yes, and I applaud uh, NATO unity, but, you know, there is a problem about coordinating sanctions where some countries are not prepared to do it and war aims where some countries have different war aims in relation to Russia. But what we've also seen is global disunity. 82 countries refuse to support 
uh, the action against uh, Russia for its breach of, civil li of, of human liberties, uh, 150 countries around the world are not imposing sanctions. So we have global disunity. And one of the reasons is we have not shown people that globalization, which is led by the West, is working uh, to reduce poverty, raise living standards, and of course deal with climate change in the poorer countries. And we really have to honor our promises. Two billion people remain unvaccinated, despite the fact we have 24 billion vaccines being produced this year. Uh, and of course, climate change promises to Africa have not been met. So we have to show that it's the world and not just NATO that can come together when we have a problem. We've, there's been a lot of comment this week about uh, Keir Starmer and his image, uh, you know, a future prime minister. Can you be a boring man, as some of his colleagues have apparently called him? Uh, you had a lot of <laughs> focus on your image when you, were, when you were leader. What is your advice to Keir Starmer? Uh, to ignore this, uh, because uh, what's exciting about the possibility of Keir Starmer's leadership is, is he will have a plan for Britain. He will show how we can get back growth. He will show how we can get living standards rising again. And he will show how we can have a fairer society that deals with problems like climate change. So I, I don't think uh, politicians uh, need to be making outrageous statements, uh, like, in fact, Grat Shamf, uh, who you're about to interview, has been today inciting people. I think uh, politicians have got a role to get people around the table, to get people talking, explaining what's happening and getting answers. Now, Keir Starmer was the director of public prosecutions. He's been a great public servant over many years, and I think he'll make a great prime minister. Gordon Brown, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Now, this was the scene just outside uh, this studio in central London this morning, or not this morning, yesterday. In fact, thousands of people marching through the capital, calling on the government to do more to help people with soaring inflation. Among them, protesters from the Rail Workers Union, the RMT, who will be walking out on strike on Tuesday, Thursday and on Saturday this week in a dispute over pay and conditions. I'm joined now by the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps. Good morning. Morning. Let's uh, start actually with what Gordon Brown was just saying. Uh, you're inciting people, is his accusation. I, I could not work out where that was coming from, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a very moderate person. I don't believe we need uh, mass strikes in this country. I certainly think people should be able to get to work next week, be able to go and do their GCSEs and A-levels like my daughter uh, needs to do, to be able to get to hospital appointments which have been delayed possibly because of coronavirus. And uh, the strike is the last thing we need. It's jumping the gun. Uh, it's unnecessary. Uh, talks are still ongoing. The ballot took place before the, um, the talks on pay had even started. It just seems the union is determined to go out on strike, the RNT, come what may. And I, I think it's a very sad situation. I call on them to reconsider. He, his point, though, was that you should be getting people around the table. You should be doing more to, to, in these talks. You have really not done very much at all, have you? When was the last time you actually talked to the RNT? Well, first of all, it's the employers who have to talk to the RMT because they're the ones with the uh, negotiations, the remit to uh, put in place to get the kind of reforms, the modernization of the railway um, that our railway's been uh, missing. Um, I'm pleased to say that railway workers are well paid. £44,000 is the medium, the average salary, £59,000 for a train driver, uh, 31000 for a nurse, 21000 for a care worker. I want railway uh, people, workers to be paid more, but don't forget we put in 16 billion pounds to keep the railways running and to keep all of those workers in a job. Not a single one lost their job during coronavirus. That's the equivalent of 600 pounds for every household in Britain. So we've done our part. Well, all we're asking now is for them to be talking and to resolve this and not go on strike. You say I think it's a, you, a fair ask. You say you've done your part, but I mean, you're in charge of the railways, aren't you? I mean, you're a transport secretary. You're, you, it's your job to make them keep them going. They're about to grind to a halt for the week. Uh, the RMT leader, Mick Lynch, wrote to you just last week. He requested a meeting without delay. He wanted to talk to you. You haven't spoken to him. Why not? So, so it is for the employers. That's Network Rail and the railway companies. They're the employers. They're the ones who need to come to a settlement with the unions. Um, I was surprised to receive the letter from Mick Lynch. It happened to be on the day when there was a debate in Parliament uh, because only last month he was saying he would refuse to meet uh, with this uh, government and that you had to understand that negotiations take place with employers. But that, you make it sound, you words, make it not, sound like you have no role at all in all this. You do. You bankroll the railways, effectively. There are emergency measures that were put in place during the pandemic. Yeah which mean that you set the ceilings. You do have a role in this, and you're yet not getting involved in these talks. 
Well, look, I, I, know, I know that Mick Lynch has said he's nostalgic for the power of the unions in the 1970s when they used to go and have, uh, you know, sandwiches in number 10. Uh, we're not going back to those days in any pay discussion, in any negotiation over uh, terms over, in this case, modernization. It's always the employer and the union who need to get together uh, to speak. I can't undermine that. These are complex discussions over about 20 different areas of modernization. I can't undermine that by suddenly walking into the room and suggesting uh, something completely different. Uh, the unions perfectly well know that those discussions take place with the employer. It's a stunt to suggest otherwise. And I have to say, yesterday afternoon, uh, the RMT walked out to go and attend a TUC rally rather than carry on those conversations, Keir Starmer which says I you actually deeply want, regret. Keir Starmer says you want these strikes to go ahead because you want to be able to feed off the division. Is he right? In what sort of crazy world would anybody want to see our transport sector come to a, a halt because uh, the RMT go on strike? Uh, that's the first comment that Keir Starmer's made on this uh, uh, hold strike in 11 days. And we discovered today, in fact, that uh, although he wouldn't say anything in Parliament, he wouldn't confirm whether he would condemn the strikes or not, it transpires that he was behind the scenes encouraging the unions to go on strike. That is not leadership from Keir Starmer. Uh, no one wants these strikes to go ahead. I think it's actually pretty offensive to millions of people to suggest that anyone uh, in government would suggest that we should okay. not have people be able to get to their hospital uh, operations, not be able to have kids go to do uh, their GCSEs and A-levels. Why would anyone want that? It's uh, uh, insane. How, much, how much is this going to cost the economy? Well, it's expensive. I mean, I know for the railways, uh, probably 100, 150 million pounds a week. I, I, I think that's small by comparison to the cost to the economy. But I want to point out that when it comes to railway work, as I mentioned, the 44,000 average salary, um, the pay rises over the last 10 years have also uh, been in excess of other areas. So, for example, nearly 40% uh, increase in, in, uh, in salaries over the last 10 years. That compares with about 16% uh, for nurses, the median, for example. The median We've got pay, to be pay, pay it fair to everybody. The median pay for an RMT worker is £33,000 a year. Do they deserve a pay rise during this cost of living crisis? I, 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 absolutely, I absolutely want to see um, people having pay rises, including the RMT workers. There was always a pay rise on the table, which is why the strike was called uh, back in April by the RMT under false pretenses, telling their members, uh, who I think by and large are much more moderate than their uh, quite extreme union leadership, that there would be no pay rise unless they, they went on strike. That wasn't true. The pay freeze had come to an end across uh, the public sector. So there was always going to be a pay rise. We need to get, you know, modernisation into the railway. Modernisation uh, means... Some of these crazy Modernisation also means job cuts, doesn't it? Yeah, that is basically what you're saying. The, you are going... There will be job losses. Uh, and we're looking for those to be voluntary. So there'll be voluntary uh, job uh, losses. That's absolutely true. However, that's because there are a whole range of jobs. For example, you no longer need to have people walking along dangerously along tracks to check those tracks. It's better, more efficient, uh, safer to use trains which can take 70,000 images per minute to check those tracks and use as fewer employees. So there are good reasons why. And that's the kind of modernisation which would improve safety, which is being held back by some of the really out-of-date 1970s practices, along with many others, including people not being able to flexibly move between uh, different roles, even where they're fully qualified to do so. The RMT leader we can't carry on. The RMT mm, sorry, leader, sorry, uh, the RMT leader Mick Lynch says that working people are fighting back. He says he would welcome a general strike. Are you expecting strike action to increase over the summer? Well, I, I think what um, uh, Mick Lynch, who, as I said, is nostalgic, he says, for the power of the unions in the 70s, forgets, when it comes to railways at least, is that whereas before uh, the railways were in competition with the roads or other forms of transport, now they're also in competition with Zoom and Teams and people working from home. So, you know, clearly uh, we absolutely want people to be able to get to work. I'm very concerned about people but being I'm able to get to But I'm talking about public sector workers and so is he. He's talking but about a general my point strike. Is, I don't think, well, my point is I don't think it will have quite the impact that he thinks uh, it, it will have or would have done in the past. I don't think there's any need for uh, broader, more widespread um, strikes. I don't think there's any need for these strikes at all. And I appeal directly to people working for the railways. You are being led down a cul-de-sac by the union leadership 
telling you that there's no pay rise when there is, uh, trying to uh, create some sort of class war when there's none to be had. We want people to be paid more. We want sensible reforms and modernization of our railway so we can run it for the passengers. And uh, I, I think everybody in this country, having paid out £16 billion pounds, or the equivalent of £160,000 per rail employee to keep it going, over the last couple of years, I will firmly believe that the unions have just got this wrong. Let's talk about uh, airlines and airports and summer holidays. Gatwick is uh, already cutting flights, we know that, over the summer, around 100 a day. Should other airports be doing exactly the same? We did write to the airports and ask them to review their plans and all of aviation. We saw those problems at Easter and then uh, at Whitson. They're obviously having a tough time. Uh, coming back from coronavirus, all the stop-start nature of, of international travel. Um, and we, want, we are working very closely with the aviation sector. We've set up a working group, they're meeting all the time, in order to put a bunch of different measures in place to try and ensure we don't see the sort of problems that we witnessed at Whitson and Easter at our airports. So one of which can we is to look... Rea I was going to say one of which is to look realistically at the flights and work out whether they're going to be able to provide them. There's no point cancelling them on the day or the day before. We'd much rather people have the opportunity to reorganise so, in advance. So, so I think they've been sensible in their approach. So can we expect that to happen? Just, just because obviously summer holidays are not that far away. Can people who've got flights booked from other airports across the UK, can they expect actually those airports, those airlines to start cutting back on flights now? I think we've probably seen the majority of what's likely to happen. Uh, there are, um, not every airport has this, but there are some airport which have particular slot arrangements for landing and taking off, which is what's happening in the background here. I'll be saying more actually about it in the week because uh, we're working on a whole series of different measures, although it's primarily for the aviation sector themselves. Government's trying to do whatever we can. I've already changed the law, for example, to make it easier to employ security staff uh, they still have to have the full vetting and checks, uh, but we can get on with the recruitment and training uh, how, quicker. And I'm looking at other measures like that to try to smooth things along. How much responsibility do you actually take? How much of the blame do you take for this case? Because Willie Walsh, the former boss of uh, British Airways, I'm sure you know, has uh, had some pretty unflattering words about you uh, this month. And he says you don't know what you're talking about. Do you regret being so quick to close the borders, open and shut the borders during Omicron? Uh, and the impact that that has had on, on the travel chaos for people. I don't, I don't know many people that Willie Walsh has ever commented on who've uh, come out with a rosy report from him. He's a, a pretty uh, vocal, uh, and I'm not going to go uh, into that. Uh, what I can say is that I think that during the uh, lockdown, obviously, we were learning about coronavirus as we went along. Um, there was no manual. There was no textbook for how you how you deal with these things. Uh, and we did the best that we could, I think, looking back on it, um, to be fair. Uh, knowing what we know now about coronavirus, the way it works, the way that vaccines interact with it. I think there are were, were things that we would do differently. And we, I've already said, uh, if we have a repeat, we'll look to go for uh, minimalizing as far as possible um, the disruption. Of course, we don't know what the future will throw at us. Uh, but look, we were doing the best that we can. I recognize that aviation is in a, uh, was in a difficult position. I have already said, and you know, I, I, I'd say it again, uh, that clearly they cut too far. It's a statement uh, of the obvious. Let me just ask you, employees. One more. Let me just ask you one more question. With the by-elections coming up uh, this week, you've got two of them in, in Wakefield and uh, Tiverton and Honiton. Twenty-four thousand majority in Tiverton and Honiton. It's unthinkable for you to lose that, isn't it? Well, as ever with these things, I just think it's the best to allow the public to have their say, to allow voters to have their say. I don't try and second-guess them uh, in, in advance. Um, having said that, by-elections are by-elections. We've seen them throughout. Time and memorial, are often they're not actually particularly reflective of anything that happens uh, at the following uh, subsequent general elections. But I make no prediction at all. Uh, about this. Well, I, why don't we leave it to the voters to have their say? We will leave it on that note. Grant Chaps, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And that is it from us. We will see you again next week. Goodbye.